folks, hello, I'm Lane Cobb. I'm here with my uh, co-host Eugene Holden and we are uh, two reverends, um, Eugene from the um, Centers for Spiritual Living and I am an interfaith reverend and we decided to start Race Talk out of a conversation where we realized that we had been kind of muted by the experience of George Floyd's um, death and we realized that people needed a space to be able to speak into, speak grief, speak uh, love, ask questions, and learn from each other about how we can be catalysts for change uh, in this country. And so we are extremely, extremely grateful to have Dr. Shoping Charles on. Um, and uh, she um, is currently the chair of the Noble National Education and Training. I'm messing this up for the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And that is the largest association of minority law enforcement leaders focused on policing and public safety. And I am actually gonna let Dr. Charles introduce herself, say a little bit about her journey. You have had your fingers in a lot of different pots, but always about empowerment and uh, creating change. Um, so what I'd like you to do, Dr. Charles, is just go ahead and turn it over to you if that's okay. And we do have some questions for you, but I'd like you to say a little bit about yourself. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is really nice to see so many faces in this room and those who are interested in really having a conversation and listening and talking about issues connected to race and the historical legacy of racism and white supremacy in this country. So thank you for joining. And I applaud you, your bravery and your courage for being able to enter this room with, with a willingness to have a conversation. So thank you. Um, as Reverend Cobbs mentioned, I'm Dr. Sophine Charles. I am, I have a, a footprint in several different disciplines. Uh, one being, I'm a retired New York City police officer. I'm an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I teach in the Police Executive Leadership Program, and I am also a child welfare advocate. I do an enormous amount of advocacy in the state of New York for agencies that are involved in providing foster care, juvenile justice, residential care, and prevention services to children and family that are involved in the family court or child welfare system. And I, I have done some work with uh, helping members who are incarcerated transition back into the community. Um, so a number of different things. Um, all of that is anchored on a race platform, meaning that I have a lens applied to all of those disciplines as we take a look at racism and the legacy of, as to how it permeates every institution and in every area of our society. And so I'll just rest there. And one of the things that I'd like to say is I'd like to know what your questions are before I just start um, literally blabbing about a lot that can be said about issues connected to race and racism. Um, what are some of the things that you're interested in? Uh, I'd like to know that, but prior to getting to those questions, I'm looking at every face on the screen. And so I see a combination of men, women, uh, people of color, black and brown people, and I see people who are white uh, with the European ancestry in this meeting. I see people of different ages. It looks like the majority of the images that I see on the screen are seniors. Many of us are seniors. And so I say that because it's really important to acknowledge that because of the different paradigms that are connected to those different areas that I just mentioned, the different demographics. And so we see the world and understand the world also from our paradigm, our worldview, 
Uh, and so having said that, I'm open to hearing what your, what your questions are. And I will circle back to the paradigm issue. So let me say that I have a couple of questions. I thought that Eugene and I might just chat with you a little bit before we open the floor. However, sure. Eugene, Eugene, I think you have, um, I love what Dr. Charles said about looking through the lens of our paradigm. And I think you have a rather unique paradigm. Um, if you'd like to share kind of how you look at the world, because I think you're kind of unique in that way. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, what, well, what I wanted to, ask, instead of doing, if you don't mind, because um, Dr. Charles was, was asking for some questions, and there is a question that I that that I have, um, you know, because I do have a, a pretty, um, my paradigm. It, everybody has a different way of looking at life and looking through these len lenses. But one of the things that I want to ask you, Dr. Charles, is is you were at one time a New York City police woman, correct? That's correct. What, what guided you, what inspired you? Cause that's a, that, that's a, that's a field that is just um, very different being a law, a law enforcement officer in uh, the States here in the New York. What inspired you to do that? Cause that's, I have a follow up question. Sure. Well, let me just say that, um, my parents inspired me to get a job. Um, when I graduated from high school, I was offered an athletic scholarship to attend Yale University. And I hid all of the letters and intercepted the phone calls and all of those uh, inlets into my home. And I did not want to go. I didn't feel that I would do well in that university setting. I didn't think that I was good enough to succeed and perform in that university setting. Now I was an A student, I was doing very well, graduated in the top 5% uh, of my class, but there's the issue of, of invalidation that many people of color experience uh, issues around self-esteem, um, that living in this society, a white dominated society imposes a psychological burden on many people of color in that the society says that we are not intelligent, we are lazy, that we don't want to work, we're ugly, and so many other things in that everything white is beautiful and intelligent and impressive and so that's the part of the psychological the pseudo psychological conditioning that's placed on both whites and blacks black believing psychologically imposed inferiority white believing psychologically and institutionally shaped feelings of superiority and so i didn't feel that i was good enough and when my parents found out that I had uh, bypassed an opportunity for a free scholarship, I was presented with, you will work and you will go to school full time. So my first job was in the uh, New York City Police Department as an administrative assistant. And while in that environment, the officers encouraged me to take the exam to become an officer. And I still couldn't believe that I, you know, ate the whole thing, but that's how I became a New York City police officer. And certainly my parents were not happy. They were okay with the administrative aid piece, but not at all with the police officer. Thank you. And you were a police officer for, for, for how long? 18 years. Okay. Um, so then what led you to go from, from, from that to what you're doing now? Well, while I was a police officer, I needed to understand what I was seeing, what I was experiencing on patrol, both internally within the department and externally outside of the department. So internally, as a Black female, I was confronted with 
all of the discriminatory acts that a person of color and a woman in a male-dominated white environment would be confronted with. And those things could be everything from getting the worst assignments to being denied uh, access to some of the better assignments and uh, so a number of things. Um, getting the, the longer end of the disciplinary stick when it comes to internal um, compliance. And then outside, I just a quick example. The very first arrest that I made as a New York City police officer, I pulled over a car um, with the white male driver, but I pulled him over because the plates were, um, I thought it was a stolen car. I ran the plates and they came back stolen. It turns out the car was not stolen, but the plates were stolen. And that's still uh, a misdemeanor offense in New York. So I arrested this white male driver in a in flat in a Crown Heights area of Brooklyn. And when I went into the station house, my white lieutenant said to me, Charles, of all the people that you could arrest, how did you manage to find a white guy to arrest? And so now I was floored because I was very happy that I had gotten, you know, it's, when you get your first arrest, it's a big deal. And I came in, I was very happy, and my lieutenant, you know, I was met with that. And so, um, so I needed to be able to understand that. That's an example of the internal piece of, of um, dealing with racism. The next arrest I made, I'm on a foot patrol in Brooklyn. I have my lunch hour and I walk into the Chinese restaurant to pick up my meal. I get my meal and I'm walking out and there is a uh, black couple. I just come in, it's a Friday. They both have been drinking. They're gonna order food, but they're arguing. And right in front of me, the male punches his partner in the face. She's bleeding, she falls on the floor. I go over, of course now it's right in front of me, so that's an assault right in front of me. So I go to make an arrest, I get one cuff on the gentleman and the woman gets up off the floor and jumps on my back. And so now they are both, I'm in a struggle with both of them. So I call for assistance and the cavalry comes, everybody, officer needs assistance, that's the word, where everybody comes running. and. The way my partners, I was so ashamed and so upset that I called because they beat the living daylights out of this couple, really beat this couple. And I'm horrified. This is only my second arrest. I'm a rookie. I'm horrified, but I'm watching the cavalry. And um, I called for help, yes, but I didn't know I was going to get that kind of help. Um, to make a long story short, I, my, that second arrest, I spent probably 48 hours in central booking and the hospital because they needed medical treatment. They were beaten pretty badly. And so those are the things that caused me to want to better understand what I was experiencing internally, externally. And I hence ended up going to, into a PhD program in counseling psychology and it was an intervention for myself so I could better understand what I was experiencing. Wow, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for that background. And one of the things that you and I spoke about um, when I invited you to come was that you wanted to talk about the culture of policing as it fits into this polit political climate. And it sounds like you're really talking there about part of that culture um, of policing. And I just was wondering whether or not you wanted to give a little more background about what you mean by culture. Um, and I understand too that there are many other countries where the culture is completely different. And perhaps because the political uh, climate is different. I'm wondering if you could say just a, a pinch about that and then maybe I do have some questions. And folks, if you wanna start to put your questions into the chat, that would be great. 
So that would help us to facilitate this conversation. Eugene, I'm watching the waiting room and if you could keep your eyes on the chat, that would be fabulous. Uh, go, go right ahead, Dr. Charles. Sure. Well, let me just say that I literally grew up in the police department. My first job as an administrative assistant, I was 19 years old. Um, so I spent a significant part of my adult life in the police environment. And I have significant friendships and very close ties to people in very high ranking positions in the police department, both black, white women and other um, ethnic groups that I'm very close to. Um, at the same time, I have lost um, friends who had been killed in the line of duty. And so I share that to say that while I am very clear about the need to transform the police department, I'm also very sensitive to the nature um, and the feelings of many police officers um, who are resistant to this notion of transforming the culture. And in order to talk about the culture of policing, it's important to know something about the history of policing. In this country, the very first organized forms of police forces came in the form of slave patrols. The, and this is again in the, the, the colonies, the 13 colonies, mainly the southern colonies, um, the white plantation owners and slave owners were, um, they were in a bit of a pickle because they needed as many slaves as they could to work the plantation, be involved with agriculture, and they brought so many over that the slaves at one point outnumbered the white plantation owners. And so they were trying to come up with some solution to protect themselves from um, uprisings and the threat of being the minority in that environment trying to enslave the majority created the problems and Africans resisted along the way every step of the way. And so the slave owners organized um, slave patrols and mandated white women, men, everyone to stop um, question and interfere in any uh, unattended uh, slaves and to question them. And it was a law that all whites were mandated to do that, whether they wanted to or not. And so um, policing starts with putting a, a focus on Africans um, that had no citizenship and no, no uh, authority to exist outside of the plantation. And so moving forward, a lot of our police forces going into reconstruction. Um, many of the ordinances that were um, put in place, the laws were about controlling now this free slave um, black population. And so uh, police, were the culture of police is mainly with certainly law and order, but also controlling the black population. Um, in the Northeast, the history of policing is framed in the context of it. And most police, most police academies and universities teach um, Sir Robert Peel as being the modern uh, father of policing, modern policing, but we're looking at the 1850s on the Northeast Coast. That's the timeline in which we begin to think about policing. Yet it started in the 1600s in the South as slave patrols. So that, that sort of frames the foundation of the culture. Uh, we are also looking at the economics of policing. Police officers make their money um, by making arrests, writing summonses, doing overtime, and that's one of the things that's never really talked about. There's an economy that is connected to policing, certainly on the personal level where officers pay their mortgages and you know take care of their homes and cars and their children based on how much that check is. And I can actually recall in New York City, October was the month 
that you made your arrest and overtime so you could have a very healthy check in December. Uh, and so it was not uncommon to have an officer come in with a young black person and say, this is the bike that I'm gonna buy my kid. This is my wife's ring or what have you. And so there was, you know, some tangible um, attachments, um, monetary attachments. And so that's one part of the culture that we're not talking about at all. And that's very important. I made my money on uh, making the rest. Um, and so there, there is this sort of, uh, if you, I don't know how much you know about Ferguson, but the economy of Ferguson was actually based on the um, civil enforcement, mainly against the African-American community in Ferguson. And that's how the police officers and the, and the city administrators would actually say to the police chief, we need to get some more revenue in order to keep certain uh, city uh, structures in place. So there's that part. And then I have to also say that there's the male dominated part in that culture where you get a group of men together and regardless of the age, there is this boys will be boys aspect and they play. An example is I can remember being on the rooftop of a push and robbery with several other officers in New York and we were on the rooftop because we wanted to make sure that the suspects didn't come out of the window, go up the fire escape and across the roof. So we're there and it's very serious gunpoint, families being held, family being held um, two floors below. This is an eight story building and a group of the cops are playing and horsing around, you know, and I was a senior officer and I said, just stop. And one of the officers turned out was involved in the Sean Bell uh, shooting and killing in Brooklyn. This was the young man who on his, uh, the evening of his wedding was shot and killed by um, white police officers. And so that, I'm, that's a part of the culture. And then you've got the police unions that protect the, there's the culture of silence. So when there is wrongdoing or criminal behavior, instead of intervening, um, there is this aspect of the blue wall of silence that operates. Now, is that everybody within the police department, every police officer? Absolutely not. The issue is that, you know, they talk about the, the uh, rotten apples and only the small element but when that element is the most powerful and culturally uh, those who are not involved remain silent, then they're all complicit, whether you are involved or not involved. So that's a part of the implicit culture that operates as well. Um, and then you've got the politicians. Let's not forget the politicians, the law and order folks who want, they want to make sure that um, they scare the hell out of white people and let them know that if you don't vote for me, I'm the law and order guy, um, you know, you and your family, you're just going to be at risk and the, the natives and the black and brown people are just going to overtake you and you're just going to be left unprotected. And so all of those factors play in into this. And then on the legislation side, we've got the, how the, uh, the laws are passed. For example, um, powdered cocaine and um, crack cocaine. The, the um, penalties associated with the two are very different. Right. Uh, crack cocaine being the, the, the poor man's uh, access and street level enforcement, you get much more time and penalty when you're caught with crack cocaine as opposed to the Wall Street powdered cocaine and police are not pounding the pavement during lunch hour around Wall Street, checking to see which of the, you know, the financial, mainly white folks and wealthy folks are 
have access and doing cocaine, you know. Uh, so there, there's so many factors that play into the culture. Thank you. Dr. Charles, along that line, um, Sarah has, has a great question. Um, Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, my question, Dr. Charles, was what type of reforms do you advocate that would balance the need to get away from this culture of violence, but also protect the um, legitimate interests of the police officers? But also, I was absolutely gobsmacked when you said that police officers' pay depends on the number of arrest, arrests. Did I hear that correctly? So I have the main question and I have that little one. I was, is that really true? <laughs> Well, let me just say that police officers, they get a baseline salary and they can increase that by the number of arrests they make in terms of overtime. When you make an arrest, you get overtime. Um, and so uh, it comes with that. In fact, there's what is called red light overtime, meaning that you can get a full eight hour shift of overtime just writing red light summonses. Um, so think about some of the motivation around having a quota. You have to bring, you know, you make a certain number. If you get the red light overtime, there's an expectation that you're going to bring in a certain number of red light summonses. So um, to be very clear, um, Ms. Sarah, that no, there's a baseline salary, and in some departments, that baseline is very low, $35,000, $40,000. If you work in Suffolk County, uh, Long Island, New York, that baseline might be 90000 So it, it depends. I'm sorry, I, I lost track of the first. I think you asked. Oh, the, the, the question was, how, what type of reforms do you recommend that would balance the, the problem of police violence and what we've seen recently okay. with the legitimate need to protect the um, interests of the, the police and their ability to do their job? Excellent question. The first thing is to remember that all activities or actions do not necessarily need to be criminalized. Um, and the one is, if you can remember, the war on drugs. So we had a, a federal administration, several of them, that um, criminalized marijuana. Uh, marijuana was not always criminalized. And uh, in, in certain states right now, it's legal. So there are certain things that do not need to be criminalized. That's one thing. Uh, the other, for example, in New York City, the New York City is under a federal um, review and, and monitoring because of the number of stop, question, and frisk activities, unlawful, unconstitutional stops, so where so many black men, and young black boys were stopped and um, without any results and illegally, unconstitutionally. So number one, police should be engaged in upholding the constitution. Uh, all activities should be constitutional. The second is um, decriminalize some of the activity that causes problems, especially in black and brown communities. Um, one example that I will give you is in New York City, children, uh, school age children, they ride the subway. And if you do not have a subway pass or a bus pass, and you try to get to school because you've lost it for whatever reason, you don't have it, the 16, 17 year olds arrested for uh, theft of services, trying to gain entry without paying uh, their fare. And so how many kids do you know who are going to go home and say, hey, mom, you know, I got a, a ticket, you know, a $75 ticket or summons. And when it's not paid, that summons turns into a warrant. And so that 16-year-old may never have another encounter with the law 
until he applies for a job or gets stopped driving a car at the age of 22. And now you pop, they say you pop a warrant. So now you're going to go to jail. Um, so I think the police certainly need uh, better supervision and there needs to be more transparency. There is this thing called deployment, where police are deployed, where the target and the focus is, is predominantly in communities of color. And the argument would be, well, those are the areas where it's the highest crime and my counter would be any community that is surveilled and monitored very closely and connected to police making arrests and the economy of policing, the police are going to find something in every community regardless to make an arrest. And um, they're going to be incentivized for that. Um, police officers, when they are released or fired or terminated from one police department should never be able to now go to another jurisdiction and get employment because that history does not follow them. Uh, so there are just so many ways that we can uh, deal with the police in terms of transforming them. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to jump in because I know that Kathy sent me some actual questions before today. So I'd like to get one of hers in if that's okay. Um, Eugene. Um, Go ahead. I know we have a lot of questions, but she has one of the things you were talking about, Dr. Charles, is that blue wall and that thing about police officers being able to go to other jurisdictions. And um, she has that question about why aren't, why is it so difficult for police officers uh, backgrounds to be made public, right? And so when they actually kill someone or they are predisposed to violence, um, why is that actually uh, kept a secret? Well, the first uh, issue is the power of the police unions. They have an incredibly powerful lobbying engine uh, in that they doing their uh, negotiations for contracts. They negotiate certain parameters, and one parameter is keeping the background of police officers secret and not exposing it. Um, just recently here in New York City, uh, Mayor de Blasio yeah. has created a policy where um, officers will no longer uh, enjoy that level of anonymity. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that the city indemnify police officers when there is legal action uh, where an officer is found to be, uh, you know, legally responsible for certain uh, behaviors or practices. And they are not personally, uh, they're protected from personal lawsuits and the city pays. So there are so many uh, reasons as to how they can maintain anonymity. Uh, but with all of the uh, protests and the demands for change and transforming police behavior and practices, that's eroding right now across the country. So many officers will be um, exposed. Thank you. And so, you know, on a, on a, on a personal note, um, there is some safety in that for the police officer, because if I make an arrest of somebody and my personal information is exposed, then my family could certainly be at risk where anyone can know where I live and come by and, uh, you know, there's security, personal safety issues around police. Eugene, what do we have in the chat? Oh gosh, <laughs> we have some really good, good stuff. Um, I was just, this is, uh, this is from Joe. Joe's, um, you know what, Joe, why don't you come off of mute and you do that? 
Hi, um, thank you. I, I'm, I apologize for posting two questions. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Joe Gentile in Rochester, New York. I'm a retired social worker and I'm also the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign here in Rochester. My, my initial question was, I read an article, I think it was in, um, might have been in the New York Times magazine about the history of the police union. And I'm wondering, uh, from your experience uh, in being a police officer and in, in, in also studying and learning about um, the history of, of, of the New York City Police Department, um, what role do you think uh, the union has played in um, either supporting or hindering reform? And do you have any thoughts or recommendations uh, going forward um, as far as the union's role uh, in, in policing? Well, let me just start with unions in general. Unions in general have been an incredibly powerful tool for poor working class people in mm -hmm. order to get benefits and um, access resources that would never, they've never, they would never have been able to accomplish individually in dealing with employers and the corporations that want to keep all the profits for themselves. And so, but that's just a blanket statement in terms of how useful the unions have been in helping poor uh, Americans access middle class. So putting that aside, the other part is that the unions were not designed and set up to protect employees when they have been involved in criminal or fatal activity as it relates to them doing their job. Um, and so there, there's a, a very interesting dilemma there for unions. Now we move into the police part of unions, uh, keeping in mind that union presidents very often are active duty police officers, as in New York City. Um, the union president is a police officer in active duty, still a civil service rank. Layered on top of that, he is the union president. And so a lot of the unions are very, they're powered by many politicians based on the um, contributions that they make to the candidates. And so when those candidates become elected, they have a certain amount of protection in dealing with unions. Uh, unions need to be, um, I think, monitored. There needs to be some sort of a, a federal uh, oversight as it comes to uh, their policies and practices and some oversight over benefits that the union get as it relates to protecting police officers, especially when they've been involved in alleged criminal behavior. There needs to be more transparency. In New York City, there's the 48-hour rule. So a police officer who may have been involved in a shooting or a fatality, they get 48 hours before they can be questioned, you know, what uh, suspect do you know that's been involved in any sort of crime get 48 hours before they can be um, interviewed or questioned. Mm. So they're, they're, it's, it's just a very long, very complicated, complex, but certainly there needs to be more access and surveillance and monitoring when it comes to uh, union behavior and practices. E Eugene, um, I think that feeds well into Joseph's question about civilian oversight boards. Can we call on Joe? Joseph? Sure, it's me, Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, yeah, my, my, my question is this. Um, so civilian review boards or civilian oversight authorities? Does it make any sense, is there any real value in a civilian oversight board or authority that lacks subpoena power? Because it, it does, a board that doesn't have subpoena has all the appearance of independence, but at the end of the day, they don't have the ability to, do, to undertake investigations independently. In many cases, 
uh, review boards are dependent on the police department to provide them with the results of an internal investigation. And the board um, doesn't have the ability to um, independently question witnesses or talk to additional witnesses. And to me, the purpose of the civilian board is to provide an independent avenue for civilians to raise complaints and not be chilled um, about making a complaint to the police department that's going to investigate itself. And so to me, having a municipality negotiate with its community and agree to create a civilian review board, but absolutely refrain from agreeing that the board can have um, subpoena power leaves the community with a false sense of security. They think they finally got the civilian review board, but it's really hollow and it doesn't have the ability to truly independently examine what happened and form their own impression um, from their own witnesses and facts to make a decision that's fair and equitable. So Mr. Mazak, there isn't anything else I can really add to that. I think that you have framed it very well. Um, you are 100% correct in that civilian review boards, they have no authority, they have no teeth, and um, many of them are under the control of the, the mayoral and police administration. They work very close together. And in New York, the mayor gets a certain number of appointments. The police commissioner gets a certain number of appointments. And whatever that investigative, civilian investigative body puts forth, uh, the police commissioner has the final determination as to whether or not to enact those recommendations. And I should also point out that historically, the uh, Kerner Commission, Kerner Commission in the 19, 1968, um, that was formed by President um, Johnson, um, after all of the 1968 civil rights riots and uprising, uh, the president enacted the, a commission called the Kerner Commission, and they put forth a number of recommendations, and not one of those recommendations were um, enforced or applied, and it was after that Kerner Commission that suggestions around creating civilian complaint review boards, some municipalities uh, independently enacted, but there were no federal enforcement of any of the recommendations. And it was the Kerner Commission found that police officers were very often, their behavior and practices became the spark and later the fuel that uh, exacerbated the riots, many of them being referred to as police riots. Hmm. Robert Russell has a great question to follow up on that. Robert, if you want to take yourself off of mute. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask it for him. Um, where did it go? Dr. Charles, what is the attitude of your students towards the Black Lives Matter movement? So we're dealing with a, let's say, pre-Professor Charles class and post-Professor Charles class. Uh, in that, unfortunately, many of the police leaders, and these are executives, these are captains and above, um, many of them did not know the history of policing, the history of racial violence in this country. In many cases, the racial violence were either um, sparked by the police or through acts of omission allowed to uh, be even more violent and lethal because they didn't act to protect uh, people of color. 
Uh, so when officers know the history, they're a little bit more informed, informed and they are able to sort of make some adjustments in their paradigm. Uh, but overall, um, I would say that many of the officers see the Black Lives uh, Movement as um, uh, a, a racial uprising uh, coming from a group of people who really um, have nothing to gripe about other than just to be violent and to take on the police. Uh, so it's very mixed depending on how educated, uh, but also along racial lines. Uh, officers of color, uh, many of them, um, they are connected to the Black Lives Matter movement based on race and experiences. Black police officers are shot and killed by white officers, some of them on duty and sometimes even shot and killed by someone from their own uh, agency um, when they're in plain clothes. So uh, many white officers not having the black lens or the experience of being confronted by uh, police violence um, can't relate and think that Black Lives Matter movement protesters are just criminals using the protest as a cover for um, to engage in criminal activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great questions, Lane. You want to take the first one? <laughs> uh, well, um, I, there are so many great questions, so I don't want to take time, but I also do want to give you an opportunity, Dr. Charles, to talk a little bit about Noble and what is the work that Noble specifically is doing, if, if you don't mind. And then I do have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, formed in 1976 as a result of Black police chiefs seeing a need to organize around putting their voice in the room, putting their voice in legislation, and making sure that the politicians and the legislators understood that there were needs in terms of police reform back then. Um, and so Noble has had the lead on the more than 3,000 uh, members across the country, including Canada, Africa, and England. And um, the majority of our work is around taking a really close look at police behavior laws and practices and putting a an african-american conscious paradigm on some of this and filtering it through our lens um, and so we we've been involved in uh looking changing use of force practices and policies across the country um getting domestic violence uh, attention where very often police historically, if they themselves were involved in domestic violence, they were not uh, penalized or arrested. So we think about domestic violence or intimate partner violence, the laws and regulations around that are still relatively new because the male dominated legislators certainly uh, didn't pay a lot of attention to that especially with women being the victims. And um, also, the, there were, Noble was involved in getting uh, armor-piercing bullets made illegal, um, bullets that could penetrate a, a, um, a bulletproof vest. Um, so looking at sentencing, really giving an informed, educated opinion and advocacy around changing a, a number of, of um, policing practices that disproportionately and punitively impacted communities of color. 
Um, so there are a number of, of, of areas that we're working on. Um, a major component of community policing. Um, Dr. Lee Brown, former mayor of Houston, is uh, the father of community policing and forcing the police to work in uh, conjunction and in partnership with the community around what the police should be focused on. And the one thing I'll say about community policing very quickly is that white communities have community policing and have always had community policing. When you hear about community policing, very often you hear of it in the context of dealing with communities of color. Um, community policing is having your precinct commander on speed dial and being able to call up his phone and say, I need you to take a look at this. Uh, community policing is when you are pulled over by a police officer and you have proximity to power of that police commander when you can say to that officer, I'm going to call your commander about this. That's community policing. Community policing is when the white slave owners organize to protect themselves against slave uprising. That's community policing. Mm. So we have a very, very short amount of time, but we, I definitely want to find out what can we do as citizens? How can we continue to educate or be active or what, how can we make ourselves most useful, do you think? Well, the first thing is, is to certainly, when you see something, say something, meaning that watch what police officers are doing. When you see something that is just unjust or not right or not fair, or there's some inequity in some practice in your community, say something, object to it, write a letter. One of the things that police officers hate is working in a letter writing community. A letter writing community is one where um, the eyes are on them and whenever anything is done that that community does not like or appreciate, they will write a letter to the mayor and to the, the uh, police chief. So writing letters, observing, saying something, putting it in writing, being involved in uh, community councils and um, putting your voice in the room, literally saying, stop doing that. Yes, thank you so much. So Dr. Charles, I want to, we want to find out if there's a way for us to follow you or there are um, resources that you would recommend that we specifically, you know, look into. So the one thing is that you are already doing it by being in this room and having this conversation and educating yourselves and becoming more familiar with what is trending uh, and getting a historical perspective. I will send you um, in the form of an email some resources that you can connect to, um, certainly some, um, some videos where you can get sort of a historical perspective and a timeline um, that gave rise to what we are experiencing today. And there isn't any particular way that you can follow me at the moment um, um, because I, I'll let you know about that, but I don't have a specific way right now. Thank you for the resources. I'm going to turn this over to Eugene because we have literally two minutes left. Eugene, I'm going to give you the last word with Dr. Charles. Dr. Charles, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, um, I, I echo what uh, Lane is saying. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Charles, for, for taking the time out to be with us today. Um, everybody, great questions, the ones that, that we got to. Um, I apologize to those few that we did not get to. This has been a beautifully powerful um, segment of race talk. I want to encourage everyone to, to invite your friends because as Lane and I have said over and over again, race talk is, is a platform where we, we want to provide a platform where we get to educate each other. And one of the things that we say is your voice matters. So again, thank you everyone for, for being here. 
this afternoon, this morning uh, on Race Talk with Lane and Eugene. And Dr. Sophine Charles, thank you so very much for, for providing such powerful information. There are things that you've brought out that I didn't know, and I'm sure that there might be two or three other people online who didn't know some of the things that, that you shared as well. So thank you so much. And thank you, thank for you for organizing for, this. And thank you for the work that you do. Because Absolutely. You do so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, everyone. Take care. Peace and blessings. Mm-hmm.